Thanks, Katie. So I've chosen a title today which is uh, intended to be uh, a little bit provocative and uh, which I hope will uh, attract your interest and attention. So could loyalty points save the world? Okay, well, about uh, two weeks ago, uh, I received uh, a new loyalty card from one of my favourite uh, uh, supermarkets, uh, which just recently launched. Um, and this card will allow that retailer uh, to now know uh, my name uh, and address. It will know where I shop and with what frequency, what products I buy. Uh, in return, uh, they will offer me the chance to accumulate points, which will lead to uh, discounts in my shopping, uh, special offers, uh, and so on and so forth. I imagine that a number of people in the audience uh, will have uh, a card uh, of this type or one uh, very similar. Um, and I think that um, typically the kind of attitudes that we might have about these products uh, might vary some way between what I would characterise as cynicism uh, and avarice. Uh, so in terms of uh, cynicism, then uh, supermarkets, a competitive business, uh, they can offer me free gifts all the time to try and keep my uh, custom. Uh, and this way, they get to generate lots of information about my shopping habits as well. Uh, perha perhaps a little bit of avarice as well. Uh, we all like the opportunity to get hold of lots of uh, uh, free stuff uh, and special offers. So maybe that feeds into our motivation in using these cards. I'd like to suggest today that in terms of uh, this utilisation there is uh, a third way of looking at this, related, if you like, to uh, altruism. So the idea that by using uh, the information that these kind of products generate, uh, we can actually realise some quite significant benefits uh, in our uh, everyday lives and, uh, and experiences. So I'd like to think a little bit um, about what some of these uh, problems and issues that we might be able to tackle with this sorts of information might be. So my experience is as a uh, professional geographer, uh, and I'm interested primarily uh, in two things. I'm interested in where things are located, and I'm interested in the way that people use um, those uh, facilities and services. So I'm going to start my campaign to save the world uh, rather improbably, perhaps, uh, with a bus. So this is actually uh, a number one bus, uh, and it's uh, running along the Otley Road, quite near to uh, the University of Leeds. Uh, and the interesting thing for me about this bus is it's following a route uh, from Holt Park to uh, the centre of the city of Leeds. And now, when I first came to Leeds in the late 1970s, uh, there was a number one bus and it followed exactly this route um, from Holt Park to the city of Leeds. Uh, there was also a 56 bus that went from Headingley to the university, exactly as it does now. Uh, there was a 508 bus that went from Leeds to Halifax. Um, and uh, I could go on for some time on the same basis. The point is that in the last 40 years, um, where the demographics profile of Leeds has changed enormously. Uh, we've had change in the location uh, of businesses um, and many uh, new businesses starting out, others being uh, closed down or moved away. Uh, and yet these bus routes uh, still essentially remain the same. Uh, so the next time that you are um, contemplating the problem that you can't get a bus to the place that you want to go at the right kind of time of day, uh, that could well be the reason why. Uh, here's a second example. This is a supermarket, not particularly um, significant, this one, but there's a lot of evidence now uh, to indicate that all over the place, big areas of uh, East Leeds, again, a very good example, uh, we have what we call food deserts. Basically, we haven't got the right kinds of provision of high quality uh, food and retail services in the kinds of place that we really, that we really need them. OK, here's a third example. This is actually a picture uh, of a house in my street. Uh, and the uh, significant thing about this one is if you look to the, uh, to the right of the house there, you can just see uh, a slightly hilly uh, area. Uh, this is uh, called the Billing in Rawdon. And this has been a subject of um, uh, desires by various property developers to try and build new housing in this location for several years. Um, and my view is that there's really no objective way that anybody can tell me, is this a good idea 
or is this a bad idea? Lots of people, uh, uh, local people who walk, uh, take their pets up there, you know, might be concerned about that. Um, other people might think it's a good thing. We, we need much more housing in the city. Okay, and here's a final example. This is a new hospital building, again, located quite close to the south side of the university, but adjacent to the Leeds General Infirmary, uh, the, the one of the main hospitals in town just down the road from here. Um, and so you know, the interesting thing about this, it's a new building, but it's on a site that's been occupied by the Leeds General Infirmary for more than 200 years. So I think what we can see here is a combination of things. We've got bus routes that haven't changed for 40 years. Uh, we've got housing where we've got no frameworks for evaluation of new developments. Uh, we've got supermarkets in, in, the, in the wrong places providing unbalanced provision. And uh, we've got hospitals on sites that have been established for years and years. So to demonstrate to you that this is not just conjecture on my part, I want to use just one slightly more substantive example. So what you're looking at here is a map which is demonstrating over the next 20 years, we've, we hear a lot perhaps in, uh, in the media and so forth about the, el uh, the aging of the population. This is going to be a big demographic change in Leeds as in other cities over the next 5, 10, 20 years. And we're looking here at where this elderly population is going to be. And you can see quite clearly the dark colours indicate the most intense um, concentrations of, of population. So we can see big growth, especially in the north and, uh, and, and east of the city. So where's this building that we were just looking at, the new hospital uh, linked to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Leeds General Infirmary site? Is it in the middle of these dark red areas of concentration of uh, ageing population? Well, no, it's right here in the centre of the city where we have big uh, uh, student populations uh, and young populations. If we consider the second major, major hospital in the city, the St James's site, a, a similar story, right in the middle here uh, amongst uh, the, the, the younger populations. Worse than that, if I look at my local hospital, uh, Airedale in Otley, uh, where the announcement's just been made that they're going to close the dementia ward, uh, and move it to Bradford, uh, the centre of Bradford. Where's that? Well, that's right here, where I might think is exactly the place where I need to be thinking about maintaining and perhaps building up these, uh, these services. Okay, so I'm going to give now one other uh, illustration of the nature and scale of this problem. Uh, and I want to talk to you for a moment about uh, HS2. So again, a, uh, a proposal, uh, a big investment that's been much in the news uh, lately uh, and has aroused quite a lot of uh, controversy about its impact and importance. Uh, you don't need to read all the words that are, that are saying here, but on the right-hand side, uh, we have a view put forward by the Transport Secretary here, advocated by the government, saying that we really need this development for balanced economic growth, uh, for future prosperity of the country, and so on and so forth. On the right-hand side there, we have an example of the views of some pressure groups who are saying that this is uh, potentially environmentally quite a damaging proposition. It isn't being put in the right place. Um, it's not, uh, the, and, the, and the scheme isn't engineered in the correct way, uh, and so forth. So we've got a lot of dissent here, uh, failure, a lack of agreement about the impacts of this project. Now, just to put this in some kind of context for you, um, if you happen to have a uh, thousand pounds uh, on your person, uh, if you'd like to deposit in a bucket on the way out, I'll make sure that the government gets hold of it on your behalf, because that's the amount that we're each going to have to contribute to this HS2 project. Okay, so it's a 50 billion pound investment. That's a thousand pounds for every man, woman, and child in this country to build uh, a high-speed two line. Uh, and really, nobody's quite sure who's going to benefit, how much, who's going to be adversely affected by it, uh, and basically whether it's a good idea. Okay, so I don't think it's necessarily all bad news. I could present a counterexample. Uh, this is the London congestion charge, which has now been running since 2003. And there's lots of evidence to indicate that this has been quite successful as uh, a policy uh, intervention. So it's not only raised money, it's improved the traffic flow, it's reduced pollution, uh, and it's reduced uh, road accidents in, in London. 
So the problem is how can we evaluate and distinguish between what may be these very good strategies for, um, uh, for, for infrastructure service development intervention um, and which might be um, uh, less valuable uh, in terms of their impact, value for money and so forth. Uh, and my contention is that the fundamental problem that we face is that we really don't understand very well um, you know, how people are using these, um, these services and, and facilities. So if we want to understand what's the impact of a high-speed two rail link going to be, now, there can't be a better starting point than actually understanding you know, who's going, say, from Leeds to London on the train on a regular basis at the moment and for what purpose. And that's the kind of thing that we've really got a very poor understanding of. So if I wanted, if I were uh, in, in terms of academic research or in terms of government policy trying to deal with this kind of problem, uh, a typical starting point would be uh, the 2011 census. What I'm looking at here is, uh, again, I'm still in Leeds, and each of these blue lines is representing a flow of uh, people between their home and their workplace as it was measured in the 2011 uh, census. Okay, so a lot of my academic geography colleagues are getting very excited about this 2011 census data because it was released recently on uh, September the, the 9th, 2014. Okay, I'm just going to repeat that slowly for you. So the 2011 census data was released on September the 9th, 2014. So what we're looking at here is information that is three and a half years out of date. I would also argue that it's very limited in its content. So we're looking at flows from home to work on census day, March the 27th, 2011. Okay, we're not considering any flows here that are concerned with people who are, again, going to retail outlets, interactions with schools or indeed universities. Uh, what about uh, trips to coffee shops, uh, football matches, patterns at the weekend, seasonal variations, holidays, maybe people were ill on this particular day, uh, and so on and so forth. So this kind of intelligence that we're used to, or data that we're used to working with, uh, to deal with these kinds of problems is really woefully inadequate. Okay, so what I'm overlaying now on the same map is a series of red bars, uh, and these bars are demonstrating similar kind of information. So an attempt to infer interactions between homes and other destinations, in, in, in this case, uh, and these are derived from Twitter feeds for uh, a sample three-month period this year. Now, the thing about the, 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 the Twitter feeds is that they're a little bit, uh, they're a little bit lumpy. They're a little bit up, of, up and down, as you can perhaps imagine, in terms of the people that are actually communicating information in this way. But also very multidimensional. Okay, so they deal with people uh, who are um, having uh, moving around for different kinds of purposes. Again, you know, it might be going to work, but it might be uh, uh, going to a shopping centre or or uh, a restaurant or what have you. And they're continually updated. So this information, you know, we could be capturing. When it, well, actually, we are streaming this uh, right at the moment uh, in the geography department, capturing this information on a minute-by-minute minute basis. It, it's a bit up and down. If we apply the right kinds of uh, evaluation mechanisms for smoothing out some of the biases and interpreting it in the correct way, I believe that it's potentially it's as fully as robust as uh, this kind of journey to work data, but it has all these other benefits uh, as well. Okay, so, so far I've talked to you about two kinds of um, information uh, that we might use to try and uh, to, to, to try and add further uh, detail to our insights about people's uh, movement and behaviour patterns. And of course, uh, I could extend that argument uh, much further. Uh, I've got a selection here of cards that I extracted um, from uh, my wallet this morning, uh, and one or two that my wife uh, has contributed as well. But uh, So I've got a Waterstones card here, so there's another retail loyalty card. Uh, I've got an Oyster card, that's a very interesting one, so that's a kind of a, uh, a smart ticketing card that is capturing for people in London, everybody moving in and out of the Tube network every day. Uh, I've got a McDonald's uh, hotel uh, uh, card there, for uh, so people can trace where I'm uh, going for, for weekends away and what have you. There's another store loyalty card. There's a Costa for a coffee club. 
Um, this one's for the library, which some of you may know, they put on the corner, which I didn't even know I had until I found it, um, and, and so on. And, and there's another uh, dozen or so there of the same ilk. So there are lots of different kinds of sources of this information, which potentially are, are, are capturing different aspects of, of our behavior and movement patterns. Uh, on this slide, I'm just going to move very, very briefly through some examples of how we're using this kind of information uh, in, our, in our research in the School of Geography. Uh, and I won't talk through these in detail, but this one is uh, looking at the housing market in, in East Leeds uh, using mortgage data to uh, um, assess the impact on uh, deprivation and, and, and social provision of housing uh, in relation to, uh, to new house building strategies. Uh, this one is considering from uh, point of sale data for retailers, uh, how people's behavior is changing in relation to environmentally friendly products. Uh, this is actually based on, on Oyster card, so potentially we can trace people's uh, patterns of movement, maybe relate that to things like changes in fares uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, this one is actually about um, uh, uh, electronic retailing. It's looking at supermarket spending habits uh, uh, over the counter as opposed to online. Uh, and this one is actually looking at patient flows. This one is concerned with the uh, control of, uh, of events, again, actually using uh, Twitter data, uh, looking in this case specifically at the annual West Indian Carnival in, uh, in Leeds. So these are all examples of the kinds of research that we're starting to undertake, uh, which potentially have quite important uh, outcomes and benefits, and none of that you could think about with these kind of conventional uh, surveys and data sources that we're used to, used to dealing with. Uh, is, there a, is there a downside to all this? Um, so, so, you know, what I'm saying is that I want to access all this kind of, um, you know, this, this, this digital footprint information, if you like, for these kind of social benefits. And that makes some people concerned. Um, so, for example, if you were to Google the uh, phrase, hands off my data, um, then, you know, what would, uh, you know, what I'd expect to happen is you come up with a series of magazine covers, people with placards in, in, in demonstrations even, uh, you know, concerned about trying to protect uh, the privacy and confidentiality of that data. Now, that's quite uh, an important issue. You know, I've got two immediate responses to it. One is that I think um, as universities and as, as academics, you know, we have a long history of dealing with personal and private data in an appropriate, confidential and, and ethical way. And that may be true in clinical studies uh, and clinical trials. It's true in social science focus groups and so forth. I see no reason why the scaling up of this to this kind of big data world should be any particular problem for us. Um, and the second consideration is actually I'm not talking about using any individual or personal data in what I want to do. If you think back to my flows on my map, you know, I'm essentially concerned with aggregated uh, anonymous patterns of, or anonymized patterns of behavior that can tell me really interesting things about the way that people are behaving uh, collectively or regularly. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I started off with a proposition could loyalty card points save the world? And you might think that that's uh, a rather big or extravagant claim to make. So to substantiate it, I could have taken a really big problem. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, if you were to read uh, this week's copy of The Economist, so there's a story in there, uh, and it says, uh, as you can read here, mobile phone records are an invaluable tool to combat Ebola. They should be made available to researchers. So I don't think you could pick uh, a bigger or more obvious important problem at the global scale just at the moment uh, than, e than Ebola. So I could have taken that kind of global view. doesn't happen to be what interests me. You know, my feeling is that these kind of uh, uh, local problems you know, also are providing us with critical issues on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, can we uh, reduce obesity, increase life expectancy by providing people with high-quality foodstuffs in the place that they need to access it? Can we get emergency vehicles to stroke victims in those first few critical minutes when the intervention really matters? You can mothers get buses to work and home again in time to pick up their kids from playgroup? You know, these are key issues for people on an everyday basis. So uh, what I urge you, and I think this is going to be a really big issue over the next few years, don't bury your data in secrecy. Allow it to be shared by responsible people um, who can really uh, use it for these important insights, and together we might just save the world. <laughs>